Hallelujah. Are you ready to get into Yah's word today? I am as well. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 22. And we're going to begin with verse 34 in just a moment. And I have a very interesting title for this message today. It's called The Two, The Ten, The Total. Let me say that again. The Two, The Ten, The Total. We're going to be talking about the commandments. You know, we have a lot of people who connect with us by social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and they're always asking the question, which of the commandments should we keep? Some say, well, you know, Jesus said there were only two. We're going to talk about the two in just a moment. And others say we should obey the ten. And a lot of people in religion, the Christian religion, do think that they ought to obey the ten, except they take a lot of latitude with the fourth commandment, which is the Sabbath commandment. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And then what about the total? Are we supposed to obey all of the Torah commandments? Well, we're going to address all of that in this video today. So have you found Matthew chapter 22? Starting with verse 34, let's read it together. But the Pharisees, having heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, were gathered together. And one of them, one learned in the Torah, did question, trying him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the Torah? So which is the greatest of all the commandments in the Torah? He was actually trying him. He was testing him. He was trying to get him to say something that was incorrect. And Yeshua said to him, You shall love Yah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being and with all your mind. All right, so this is the Shema. Of course he's going to quote the Shema. That is the greatest of all commandments of the Torah. To love Yah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being and with all your mind. Verse 38, this is the first and the great commandment. And then he goes on to talk about the second. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says, on these two commands hang all the Torah and the prophets. All right, so these are two commandments. One is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. The other one is found in the book of Leviticus. One says you're to love Elohim, and the other says that you are to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, people in religion will say those are the only two commands that, quote, Jesus taught us to obey. That's just not true. What Yeshua is saying here is that these are two broad categories of commandments. Love Elohim and all the commandments in the Torah that talk about how we love Elohim. And then love people. And there's all the commandments in the Torah that talk about how we can love people. This is not just two commandments. A lot of people say, well, you know, it's just love God, love people. And then they want to define what that means. They don't go any further. They don't look at the 10. They don't look at the total. They just say you're supposed to love God and love people. I'm speaking in the language of people in religion. But that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about two broad categories of commands. And all the other commandments fit into these two broad categories. It says, on these two commands hang. Doesn't mean that all of the other ones have been abolished. On these two commands hang all the Torah and the prophets. So we see the two here. But if you want to understand how to love Elohim and how to love people, you have to go further and you have to look at the 10. And so when Yeshua was quoting love Elohim, he was quoting Deuteronomy 6, 5. And when he was saying love your neighbor, he was quoting Leviticus 19, 18. All right, now let's go over to Exodus chapter 20 and we'll pick up with verse 1. And this is the 10. Now you've heard about the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words. We're going to briefly read through these and then we're going to talk about the two broad categories of commandments that Yeshua mentioned in Matthew 22. Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And Elohim spoke all these words saying, I am 
Yah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You have no other mighty ones against my face, no other deities against my face. In other words, don't worship any other, quote, mighty ones other than me. You do not make for yourself a carved image, no carved images or any likeness of that which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. So don't make any idols. Don't make any carved images. Don't bow down and worship them and serve them. For I, Yah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, don't be in that group, but showing loving commitment to thousands to those who love me, I'm in that category, and guard or keep my commands. Verse 7, you do not bring the name of Yah, your Elohim, to naught. Don't diminish the name of Yah. For Yah does not leave the one unpunished who brings his name to naught. And then verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to set it apart. Your Bible may say keep it holy. Six days you labor and shall do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to Yah, your Elohim. You do not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Verse 11, for in six days, Yah made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, Yah blessed the seventh day and set it apart. And then look at verse 12. Respect your father and your mother so that your days are prolonged upon the soil which Yah, your Elohim, is giving you. It's the first commandment with promise. You do not murder. You do not commit adultery. You do not steal. You do not bear false witness against your neighbor. You do not covet your neighbor's house. You do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant nor his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. All right, so now we have 10 to look at. We want to see if these 10 will break down into the two commandments that Yeshua mentioned earlier in this sermon that we talked about in Matthew chapter 22, verse 34. We see that there are four love Elohim commands in the 10 words. So if you really want to know how to love Elohim, you have to look at the 10. You have to get beyond the two, look at the 10. And so what do we see in the 10? What commandments speak of loving Elohim? Well, the first one is, have no other mighty ones before my face. So serve Yah, your Elohim alone. The second commandment is no carved images, no idols, don't worship idols. The third one is don't diminish the name of Yah. Don't bring his name to naught. And the fourth one is remember the Sabbath day to keep it set apart. So now we have four ways that we can worship and love Elohim. So if we're going to fulfill that very first and great commandment to love Elohim with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, here are four ways that the scripture tells us to do it. Worship him alone. Do not worship idols. Do not diminish the name of Yah and remember the Sabbath day to keep it set apart. So we have four of the ten. The very first four are love Elohim commandments. And then we have six love people commandments in the ten words. So the first one is respect your father and mother. It's the first command with promise so that it will go well with you and you'll live long on the earth. So if you want to have a good life, a healthy life, a long life, then respect your father and your mother. The second one is do not murder. The third one is do not commit adultery. The fourth one is do not steal. The fifth one is do not bear false witness against your neighbor. So don't go to court and lie about your neighbor because whatever punishment would have come to him because of your lie 
comes upon you. And then the sixth commandment is do not covet your neighbor's belongings. Now, I want to take just a, a brief moment because I think most people who are sincere, who are sincerely trying to follow Abiyya and follow Yeshua, those who are even in the Christian religion, they believe that the Ten Commandments are commandments that we should follow. Most do. Some don't. But they get to the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it set apart, and they give it such latitude. And if you, if you look at the fourth commandment, it's the greatest commandment in sheer number of words. It's the longest of all the commandments. It's the greatest in the number of details that are provided. It is so specific, and yet that's the commandment where religion gives latitude. In other words, they, they don't take it as it's written, Instead, they say it's a principle, the Sabbath principle. You know, you, you need to get rest. So pick a day, any day. And uh, they want to put the Sabbath on Sunday or they want to make the Sabbath, you know, on one of the other days. And so it's interesting that they say often, well, Jesus is my Sabbath. Well, but did, quote, Jesus Obey the murder commandment so that you could get away with murder? Did Jesus not steal so that you can go steal? Did Jesus not commit adultery so you can commit adultery? It makes no sense to say Jesus fulfilled the Sabbath or is my Sabbath so that I can ignore the Sabbath. And it's also interesting to me that the fourth commandment is the only commandment that starts with the word remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it set apart. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Because this is the commandment out of the ten that religion has forgotten or has twisted, changed, altered, given latitude to. Why? Because they don't want anyone, including Abiyya, messing with their play day, with their Saturday. So the Almighty is saying, remember the Sabbath day. Don't forget it. Keep it set apart. He set it apart originally, and the commandment says we're to keep it set apart. All right. Now, here's an interesting passage that, that I really love because it, it shows a great truth. So there's a a man who comes to Yeshua and he's interested in how to possess everlasting life. How can I have everlasting life? And we read about it in Matthew chapter 19, beginning with verse 16. And see, one came and said to him, good teacher, what good shall I do to have everlasting life? And so he understood that for him to have everlasting life, there were certain things that were required of him. That it wasn't just some mental acknowledgement, that it went beyond just acknowledging a fact. It went to his very life and how he behaved and what he did. He's saying, what good thing must I do to have everlasting life? Now, do you think Yeshua was going to lie to him? Yeshua said, follow me. He said, follow me. Follow my way of life. Say what I say. Do what I do. Let me be your example. Do you think he's going to lie to him here? Of course not. Verse 17, and he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except one Elohim. All right, so he is making a distinction between himself and the Father. He had the power of attorney when he was on the earth. He was the perfect representation of the Father on the earth, but he was not the Father. And so he's saying, don't call me good, only call Elohim good. But if you wish to enter into life, what does he say here? If you wish to have everlasting life, he said, guard or obey the commands. Guard or obey the commands. He could have said anything, but what did he say? If you want to enter into life, guard the commands. He said to him, which? In other words, which command? He's kind of confused like a lot of people in religion today. Which command? Which, which ones? And Yeshua said, you shall not murder. 
You just heard about that one. You shall not commit adultery. There's two of the ten. You shall not steal. There's three of the ten. You shall not bear false witness. There's four of the ten. Respect your father and your mother. There's five of the ten. And then he goes on and he says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So he quoted five of the love people commandments that are in the Ten Commandments. And then he also quoted, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, which is Leviticus 19, verse 18. And that one's not in the Ten Commandments. That's a Torah commandment. It's in the total. It's not in the Ten. So when this man asked about what he should do to have everlasting life, Yeshua said, obey the commands. He then quoted the love people commandments that are found in the 10, but he also quoted the love your neighbor commandment, which Yeshua said was the second behind love Elohim. And that's found in Leviticus. It's not in the 10. So we're seeing here that Yeshua is not saying there's just two. And we're seeing here that Yeshua is not saying just obey the 10. What we're seeing here is a pattern where Yeshua is saying we need to obey the total. All right? Look at verse 20. The young man said to him, All these commandments that you just mentioned, I have watched over from my youth. What do I still lack? He's saying, if there's anything else, then please tell me. Yeshua said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Follow me in my Torah lifestyle. Now, here is the problem that this man had. He was a wealthy man. He had a lot of wealth, a lot of material goods. And Yeshua knew that this man put his wealth, his material possessions above Elohim that he loved wealth more than Elohim. And so when this man said, what shall I do to have everlasting life? Yeshua said, obey the commandments. He said, which ones? Yeshua didn't start with love Elohim. Don't have carved images. You know, don't diminish the name and keep the Sabbath. He started with all the love people commandments of the 10, but he also quoted the love your neighbor commandment as part of the total. Then when the man said, I've done all these, what do I still lack? Then Yeshua started dealing with the root of the issue, which was his love for money. And so he said to him, if you want to be perfect, go sell what you have, give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me in my Torah lifestyle. And when the young man heard the word, this is verse 22, he went away sad because he had many possessions. Yeshua goes on to say, it's easier for a thick rope to go through the eye of a tiny needle than for a rich man to enter in to the kingdom. And so this is a wonderful thing that we should see and learn from, that Yeshua is not saying it's just the two, or the ten, but he's now opening it up to the total. And if we obey the commands, of course, we'll only be able to do that when we believe in Yeshua and receive the indwelling set-apart spirit who gives us the want to obey and the power to obey. So you can't do it without believing in Yeshua. But once you believe in Yeshua and you receive the indwelling set-apart spirit, then you're prepared to obey the commandments, and walk in righteousness. And Yeshua said, that's the way, that's the way you're going to have eternal life. All right. Now, let's go over to Matthew chapter 5, start with verse 17, and this is going to tell us that Yeshua taught to obey the total of the Torah commandments, all the Torah commandments. Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 17, Yeshua said, Do not think I came to destroy the Torah of the prophets, that word destroy means to abolish, to do away with. 
Do not think that it was my purpose or my mission to come and abolish the Torah or the prophets. And it starts out with a charge. Do not think. And that's where religion goes wrong because that's a thought that religion has had and embraced and taught that Yeshua came to obey so that we could disobey. That Yeshua came and lived righteously. He, he lived a life of complete obedience so that we could live unrighteously and lawlessly and live a life of disobedience. That doesn't make any sense. Yeshua said, follow me. Follow me in the ways that I lived, in the things that I believed. Follow me. And that's what we're doing. We're doing that in this movement. We're simply simplifying religion because religion is so complicated. And we're getting back to following Yeshua in the most authentic and pure unadulterated way possible. And he lived a Torah lifestyle. Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah of the prophets. I did not come to destroy or abolish, but to complete or to fill it up. Other translations say fulfill. That just means to fill it full. To fill it up to its deeper spiritual application. For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, because when the Torah was given, the witnesses to the giving of the Torah were the heaven and the earth. And so as long as the witnesses exist, as long as there is a heaven and the earth still exists, then the Torah still exists. For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, one yod, that's the smallest of the Hebrew letters, or one tittle, a tittle is the little tiny decorations on the Hebrew letters, shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. And there are things written in the Torah that still have not come to pass yet. So the tiniest of the Hebrew letters and the little tiny decorations shall by no means, no means, pass from the Torah till all that's written in the Torah come to pass. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands, what commands is he talking about? He's talking about the Torah. So when he says these commands, he's talking about Torah commands. We talked about the first and the greatest command and then one like it. We discussed that just a few moments ago. But this is not talking about the greatest of the commands. It says whoever then breaks one of the least of these Torah commands and teaches men so, which is what religion has done, shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. Now listen, religion says that Shaul or the Apostle Paul used his writings to abolish the Torah. If that's true, then Shaul or the Apostle Paul has broken many of the least of the Torah commandments because he says they're abolished. And he teaches other men to break them. But notice it says, whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. Do you think Shaul or the Apostle Paul is least in the reign of the heavens? I don't think so. But whoever does, whoever obeys the least of these Torah commands, actually it's talking about all of the commands, and teaches them, I praise Yah that the revelation came to me. And, and now for several years, I've been teaching the Torah commands. And notice what it says. He shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. I'm not doing it to be called great. But Yeshua said, if I obey the Torah commands and teach others to obey them, then I will be called great in the reign of the heavens. And so we're going to look at a few of the verses that Yeshua quotes in this Matthew chapter 5 sermon and see if they're the two, the ten, or the total. We're talking about these commands. Verse 27 says, You heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. Well, that's part of the ten, is it not? Verse 31 
And it has been said, whoever puts away his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. That's not part of the 10. Divorce is not covered in the 10. This commandment is in the total. So Yeshua is talking about those who break these commands and teach others to break them will be called least in the kingdom. Those who obey these commands and teach others to obey them will be called great in the kingdom. So he's talking about what commands? These commands, Torah commands. And we find in verse 27, we find one of the Ten Commandments. And then in verse 31, we find one of the total commandments. It's a Torah commandment that's not found in the Ten. And then verse 33 says again, You heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to Yah. All right, that's part of, of the total commandments. You heard that it was said, verse 38, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's not part of the 10. That's part of the total. And so we're seeing here that Yeshua is teaching us that we need to obey and teach others to obey the Torah commandments. We're talking about the total of the Torah commandments. Now, one of the things that people say in religion is that the commandments are divided into the moral law or the moral commandments and the ceremonial commandments. And they say that the moral commands are still binding, but the ceremonial commandments have been abolished. And I want to say this to that. No part of the eternal Torah can be abolished. Man does not have the right to abolish any part of the eternal Torah. Psalm 119 tells us that the Torah is eternal. All his righteous right rulings are forever. Religion cannot abolish any portion of the eternal Torah. A man cannot abolish any portion of the eternal Torah. What, what audacity. What arrogance, what hubris for anyone to say that they can abolish a part of the eternal Torah or for religion or a denomination to say that a certain part of the eternal Torah has been abolished. It's just not true. You cannot abolish any portion of the eternal Torah. So what about the commands that pertain to the temple in Jerusalem? What about the commands that are in the Torah that pertain to the Levitical priesthood? What about the commandments that pertain to the sacrifices? People ask about that all the time. These have not been abolished, although you hear people say that they have. These have been exalted in Yeshua. These commandments are being fulfilled in the heavenly tabernacle, they're being fulfilled by Yeshua, who is our faithful and great high priest. He is fulfilling all of the commandments that pertain to the priesthood. He has fulfilled all of the commandments that pertain to the sacrifices because he's fulfilled the, the types, the pictures that those sacrifices represented. And I want to show you that in Scripture. Those commandments have not been abolished. Those commandments have been exalted. And Yeshua is completing them. They're being fulfilled even now as we preach this message. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 4 and pick up with verse 14. It says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, so we still have a high priest, who has passed through the heavens. What's his name? Yeshua, the son of Elohim. He is our high priest. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was tried in all respects as we are apart from sin. So he could be very sympathetic. He knows what we're going through. He knows the struggles. He knows the tests. He went through everything that we've ever been tested in, but he made it without sin. Verse 16, therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of favor in order to receive compassion and find favor for timely help. 
So he's still on the job. How are we going to get timely help if he's no longer on the job? We have a high priest in the heavenly tabernacle and he is performing the duties of a high priest on our behalf. So we can come boldly to the throne of favor to receive compassion and find favor for timely help. Then look at Hebrews chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. It says, Now the summary of what we are saying is, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the greatness in the heavens and who serves in the set-apart place and of the true tent which Yah set up and not man. So this is talking about Yeshua serving. He's still on the job. He's serving as our high priest. And he is in the heavenly set apart place. Or the heavenly, holy, as your Bible may say, temple. And it's the true tent. Because the one that was on the earth was a type, a shadow, a picture. Picturing the true tent, the true tabernacle, which Yah set up and not man. And then look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24. But he, speaking of Yeshua, because he remains forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. He's still on the job. All of those commandments in the Torah are being fulfilled by Yeshua. He's fulfilling them. He's still on the job. Therefore, he is also able to save completely those who draw near to Elohim through him, ever living to make intercession for them. This is not just talking about prayer. A lot of times people will use this word intercession and, and they'll say, well, Yeshua is praying for us. No, he is interceding as a high priest. He's acting as a high priest on your behalf. He's fulfilling everything that the Torah said and commanded about the high priest, about the priesthood, about the sacrifices, about the temple. All of those things are being fulfilled in the heavens because those Torah commandments were given to a priesthood on the earth. And that tabernacle or temple, those sacrifices, that high priest, they all pictured the reality in the heavenlies. They were a type, a shadow, a picture. And so all those commandments given to the high priest, to the priesthood, given to the people about the temple and the sacrifices, they all pictured what was already going on or what would when Yeshua arrived there as the high priest. They pictured the reality. And so if Elohim told Moshe to tell the priest, to tell the high priest, to tell the people, these are commands that pertain to the type and the shadow. Don't you know that the reality fulfills them all? So what am I saying? These commandments that some say are, are the ceremonial commandments that have been abolished, they haven't been abolished. They are fulfilled in Yeshua. And they continue to be fulfilled in Yeshua. All right, let's get back to Hebrews chapter 8, and verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and slaughters. This is talking about the Levitical high priest. So it was also necessary for this one, Yeshua, to have somewhat to offer. For if indeed he were on earth, he would not be a priest because he was of the tribe of Yehuda and not Levi. Since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the Torah, that's the tribe of Levi, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly, as Moshe was warned when he was about to make the tent or the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. So Yah showed Moshe the pattern it was a blueprint of what was in the heavenlies already. And so every Torah commandment that pertained to that type, to that shadow, those commandments were given because of the reality 
that existed in the heavenlies. So, again, those commandments are not abolished. They're fulfilled. Look at verse 6. But now he has obtained a more excellent service, speaking of Yeshua, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was constituted on better promises. All right, now go to Hebrews chapter 9. We'll pick up with verse 1. We'll read a little bit more here. It says, Now the first covenant indeed had regulations of worship and the earthly set-apart place. By the way, covenant is not in the original. That was added by the publisher. It says, Now the first indeed had regulations of worship and the earthly set-apart place, the earthly tabernacle, for a tent was prepared, the first part, in which was the lampstand and the table and the showbread, which is called the set-apart place. By the way, all of these things are still in the tabernacle in the heavenlies. And after the second veil, the part of the tent which is called most set-apart, to which belong the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that held the manna and the rod of Aharon that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, and above it the cherubim of esteem were overshadowing the place of atonement, about which we do not now speak in detail. And these having been prepared like this, the priest always went into the first part of the tent, accomplishing the service. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for sins of ignorance of the people, the set-apart spirit signifying this, that the way into the most set-apart place was not yet made manifest while the first tent was standing. Look at verse 11. But Messiah, having become a high priest of the coming good matters through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, entered into the most set-apart place once for all, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, having obtained everlasting redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the defiled sets apart for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of the Messiah, who through the everlasting spirit offered himself unblemished to Elohim, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living Elohim. And because of this, he is the mediator of a renewed covenant. Look at verse 24. We're going to read just a few more verses. For Messiah has not entered into a set-apart place made by hands, not the earthly one, figures of the true, pointing to the true one in the heavenlies, but into the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of Elohim on our behalf. He's our high priest. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters into the set apart place year by year with blood, not his own. For if so, he would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the offering of himself. And as it awaits men to die once and after this, the judgment so also the Messiah, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time apart from sin to those waiting for him unto deliverance. I, I just had to preach the good news. That, that's what these verses are all about. What is the point? The point is that there is no division between moral and ceremonial commandments. There is no truth to what's been said that the moral Torah commandments still stand, but the ceremonial commandments do not. The ceremonial commandments have simply been elevated. They simply have been exalted and they are being fulfilled by Yeshua in the heavenly set apart place. All right. Now go with me over to 1 Peter chapter 2 and we'll pick up with verse 4. And we'll also see that not only is there a heavenly set-apart place, 
But we as the believers in Yeshua, the people of Elohim, become a set-apart habitation of Elohim on the earth. So 1 Peter 2, 4 says, Drawing near to Him, to Yeshua, a living stone, rejected indeed by men, so He was rejected by men, but chosen by Elohim and precious, you also as living stones. And you're going to be rejected by men, but you're also chosen by Elohim and precious. You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a spiritual set apart place, a set apart priesthood. So on the earth, you participate in a set apart, your Bible may say holy priesthood. What do set apart priests do? To offer up spiritual slaughter offerings acceptable to Elohim through Yeshua Messiah. So in essence, we also are fulfilling the wonderful commands in the Torah that pertain to the set apart place because spiritually we have become the set apart place on the earth. We are a spiritual house. We are a spiritual set apart priesthood and we offer up spiritual slaughter offerings of praise and thanksgiving, worship and adoration, acceptable to Elohim through Yeshua Messiah. Well, Yeshua is our Passover lamb. He is our sin offering. He is our scapegoat. And He fulfills all of the Torah commandments that pertain to the sacrifices. All right. So we hear on occasion... People in religion who want to try to have a gotcha moment, they'll say, well, you say that you keep the Torah commandments. Do you go up to Jerusalem three times a year to celebrate the feast? Well, the reality is there's no physical temple. And the commandment was for the males of the land to go to Jerusalem three times a year to celebrate certain feasts, but they were to go up to the temple. And there's no physical temple there. And the body of Messiah, as I just mentioned, is the spiritual temple. So where two or three are gathered together in my name, Yeshua said, there I am in their midst. So we're not in the land. We're far away from the land. And so we're not obligated by Torah to go to a temple that doesn't exist. We are the temple, and we celebrate the feast. We can't observe them because there's no temple. We're not offering sacrifices, but we celebrate them, and that makes complete sense. So those commandments that pertain to going up to Jerusalem, we are able to be together as the temple, and we are able to celebrate the feast as the scripture would have us to celebrate. All right. People always say, what about the death penalties? What about the death penalties? If you are a Torah observant person, then you're going to have to stone people who have committed adultery. You're going to have to execute people who have murdered. And so I want to just touch on a few verses here to help bring some clarity to this. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. It says, let every being be in subjection to the governing authorities. We are not in a theocracy in Israel. We are not governed by people who are following the Bible. I live in the United States of America. Uh, we are a democratic republic and uh, we have civil law. And many of our civil laws come straight out of the Bible, even those that pertain to death penalties come straight out of Scripture. But we have civil governing authorities that we have to submit ourselves to. We have to obey the laws of the land. We cannot take the law into our own hands and commit vigilante justice and stone someone who we feel like committed adultery. It just doesn't happen in our day. It didn't happen in Yeshua's day. It didn't happen in Shaul's day. 
And so it says, let every being be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from Elohim, and the authorities that exist are appointed by Elohim. So he who opposes the authority withstands the institution of Elohim. So if you oppose the authority, if you go against the law, then you're going against the institution of Elohim. And those who withstand shall bring judgment on themselves. So if you try to exact some some execution on someone who was committing a sin that the Torah says has a death penalty associated with it, then you yourself would fall under judgment because you'd be breaking the civil law. Verse 3, For those ruling are an object of fear, not to good works, but to evil. Do you wish to be not afraid of the authority? Do the good, and you shall have praise from it. For it is a servant of Elohim to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword in vain. It has the authority of of judgment and execution. For it is a servant of Elohim, a revenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And then we find over in Titus chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, To be subject to rulers and authorities to obey and to be ready for every good work. So again, we have to submit ourselves to rulers, to authorities. We have to obey the civil laws. And we're not living in Israel in a theocracy with a government that obeys the Bible completely. Not even Israel today in the land. They also are a form of a democracy and have civil laws. And the the religious people there cannot just go and exact judgment on people who have broken biblical law. Luke chapter 24, verse 45, it says, Then he opened their minds, speaking of Yeshua, to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it has been written, and so it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise again from the dead the third day, and that, look at verse 47, repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And so that is what we are to be preaching today. We are to be preaching repentance. You can repent of your sins as long as you're not living a lifestyle of perpetual, intentional sin. You can repent of your sins. And if you repent, your sins can be forgiven. That's our message. Our message is not, oh, if you commit murder, then you're going to get stoned. If you commit adultery, we're going to stone you to death. Yeshua came and paid our death penalty. And he took the death out of the law for those of us who believe. So the death remains in the law for those who will not believe but they're not going to receive that death sentence as long as they have breath in their body. But when they die or if Yeshua returns, then they're going to have to face the death penalty. But for those of us who believe, Yeshua has taken the death out of the law. And we're so thankful. Now we don't obey the commandments because we're afraid of the death penalty. We obey the commandments because we love the one who paid our death penalty. In this wonderful new covenant that we have with Abba Yah in Yeshua, we have a completely different motivation. It's not fear. It's love. We obey not because we're afraid. We obey because we love the one who paid our death penalty. And then I want to show you one final passage in Isaiah chapter 2, starting with verse 2. And this tells us that the Torah will be taught in the millennial kingdom. So think about it. We have the Torah given during the time of Moshe. We have, that's the written Torah. We have Yeshua teaching the Torah and commanding that the Torah be taught and obeyed. We didn't have time in this message to show you that Shaul also taught the same thing that Yeshua taught, that the Torah should be taught and obeyed. And then we find out that in the millennial kingdom, 
the Torah is going to be taught. So the Torah was never abolished. Yeshua said, do not think that I came to destroy or abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy or abolish, but to fill it up to its deeper spiritual application. And so if the Torah is going to be taught in the millennial kingdom, don't you think we ought to pay attention to it now? It doesn't make any sense that the written Torah given to Moshe all during that period up into the time of Yeshua and then we see it again in the millennial kingdom for religion to come in and say that little tiny sliver in there is a Torahless period of time which when you say Torahless you really mean lawless period of time. Now there's a reason why the world is so lawless and getting worse all the time. That's because the, quote, church teaches a doctrine of lawlessness that Yeshua obeyed so we don't have to. I find that interesting because Yeshua obeyed perfectly and is called the righteous one. And he said, follow me. Do you think he's saying to us, follow him in, in righteousness or follow him in lawlessness? Because there is one called the lawless one. And he is the anti-Messiah. And he is going to rise up in an environment of lawlessness. He wants people to reject the Torah. So there's two camps. The righteous one who obeys the Torah. The lawless one who disobeys and rejects the Torah, which camp do you want to be in? Let's go over to Isaiah chapter 2, pick up with verse 2. Again, this tells us that the Torah will be taught in the millennial kingdom. And it shall be in the latter days that the mountain of the house of Yah, when it's talking about the latter days, it's talking about the millennial period, that the mountain of the house of Yah is established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. It'll be a place of great exaltation. And all nations shall flow to it. So the nations are coming to it. And many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Yah, to the house of the Elohim of Yaakov, and let him Teach us his ways. And his ways are found in the Torah. And let us walk in his paths. His paths are found in the Torah. For out of Sion comes forth the Torah. So the Torah is coming out of Sion in the millennial period. Yeshua is going to teach the Torah from the house of Elohim in Jerusalem during the millennial period. For out of Sion comes forth the Torah and the word of Yah. So what is the word of Yah? The Torah. From Jerusalem. Verse 4, And he shall judge between the nations and shall reprove many peoples and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither teach battle anymore. That's how we know this is in the millennial period. And so again, we see that Yeshua is going to teach Torah. He was the ultimate Torah teacher when he was on the earth some 2,000 years ago. He didn't come to bring some new message. He didn't come with his own words. He says, the words that I speak are not my own. It's not some new message. I'm not bringing some new word. He says, but they're the words of the one who sent me. And so Yeshua came to teach the words of Elohim. And the words of Elohim were already written and declared in the Torah of Elohim and the prophets, because he did. He quoted the prophets too. He didn't come with some new message. He came to be the ultimate Torah Teacher, He taught the Torah and teaches us how to obey the commandments 
by grace in the Spirit, by favor in the Spirit, because what is definitive of the new covenant? We believe upon Yeshua, and so is fulfilled the promise of the Father when Elohim promised Avraham and his capital S seed, Yeshua, the Messiah, that through Avraham and Yeshua, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And Shaul tells us the ultimate blessing is to receive the indwelling set-apart spirit who takes the Torah, Yermiyahu 31, starting with verse 31, who takes the Torah and places it in our minds so that we think about how we can love Elohim the way He wants to be loved, through obedience, and He inscribes it upon our hearts. It becomes a part of us. Hallelujah. And Ezekiel tells us that Abiyah gives us His Spirit. He takes that old heart of stone out of our flesh, gives us a heart of flesh. That's the want-to heart. And the Scripture says, he causes us to walk in His laws and guard His right rulings, and we shall do them. That's definitive. Obedience to the Torah is definitive of what's called the new covenant. And so, which commandments are we to obey? We're to obey the total. We know that the two that Yeshua mentioned are broad categories. Love Elohim and love people. But to know how to love Elohim and love people, we can go to the 10 and we can find four love Elohim commandments. We can find six love people commandments. But Yeshua took it further than that. He wants us to obey and teach others to obey these commandments. And he mentioned not only some of the 10 commandments, but he also mentioned Torah commandments. So in essence, and in other places that we've looked We've seen him quoting the total as well as the 10. And so we come to the conclusion of this message that obedience, obedience is part of the great salvation that we've experienced in Yeshua. And we are to obey all the commandments. Yeshua quoted the Torah when he was facing off with the devil. And the devil said, if you're the son of Elohim, turn this stone into bread. And Yeshua said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of Yah. At that time, the writings of the emissaries didn't exist. The good news accounts didn't exist. The book of Acts didn't exist. All the writings of Shaul didn't exist. And Yeshua said, man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of Yah. And he was talking about the Torah. He was talking about the Nevi'im, that's the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings, the original Hebrew scriptures. Each time he faced off with the devil, he quoted the Torah. And there's devil defeating power in the Torah. And so if you want to abolish the Torah... You are abolishing your power. But we have a message that's true to Scripture that tells us that through belief in Yeshua, we receive the promise of the Father, the indwelling set-apart Spirit, who gives us the want to obey and the power to be obedient. Hallelujah.